Without further ado, um, welcome, Guillermo. It's a pleasure for you to be here. Thank you, Gio. It's lovely to be here. Nice to meet you all. Um, before I start with my first question, just to really get um, get um, the best for our audience, can you please raise your hands if you're from Kings? Brilliant, some people. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you're from the Judge Business School? Yay, amazing. <laughs> um, can you please raise your hand if you already do have a venture or are working on a venture? Amazing. And can you raise your hand if you are considering maybe a career in entrepreneurship, maybe you want to start your thing, you're playing with an idea? Amazing. So you're at the right event. We love to see that. And that leads me to my first question, Jeremy. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and give us a background about the institution you're currently leading. Yeah, so again, thanks so much for the invite. Lovely to be here, lovely to meet you all. I have to say, if I think if you were in any other university around Europe and you asked people to put up their hands about how many people were looking to drive a venture, I don't think you'd get a 50% hit rate in audiences, even if it was a theme around entrepreneurship. So I think it's really kind of interesting that Cambridge has that, that piece to it. Um, in, in terms of my own background, I have a... PhD in physics, so I came through that kind of classic uh, science research route. Uh, I postdoc at Princeton for a while, um, and then I lectured in uh, Trinity College Dublin for a while, um, but then joined a number of startups that came out of university. So three different venture backed startups, one around uh, uh, display technology, one around uh, high power battery technology in Lausanne in, in Switzerland, and one around um, high throughput screening uh, delivery tools for the pharma industry. Um, and then I went back into university and ran a nanoscience research institute. And from there went to run in Trinity College, the uh, innovation uh, operations for the university. Uh, and then just before I came here, I spent five years trying to establish um, an innovation district in Dublin and a new second campus for Trinity College as a university. So uh, I began to feel like a, second-hand car salesman working in property. It's kind of a strange role, but it was, it was lots of fun. And then I started here in um, August last year in uh, Cambridge as the chief executive of Cambridge Enterprise. So Cambridge Enterprise has uh, kind of four, uh, I suppose, revenue generating business elements, four different kind of business units. Um, one part is it supports faculty and indeed postdocs within the university who are interested in doing consultancy. So if a faculty member or a, a postdoc has a company that wants to work with them, um, but they don't want to have the overhead of dealing with contracts or liability insurance, or you know, even the, the billing process and all that kind of stuff, then they can run that consultancy work through Cambridge Enterprise. And we do all the kind of management of that relationship for the faculty. And the reason it's worth just explaining that is because actually, that's the number one thing we do from a volume perspective. So about 450 faculty a year work with the enterprise community and through Cambridge Enterprise through consultancy. And that's the most effective way actually to do knowledge transfer from the kind of research that's going on in the university to kind of impact the world. So that's really important. The other pieces that we do is that we, um, we manage the uh, intellectual property assets for the university. And I was just saying earlier um, when I was chatting outside that what's quite special about Cambridge, and it's kind of important for people to get their heads around it, but Cambridge spends somewhere around 650 million pounds a year on research as a university, which is a huge sum of money. Um, and what we try to do is identify all of the intellectual property that's generated from that spend and either uh, protect it through patents or develop a kind of intellectual property strategy for that piece of innovation. But more importantly than that, what we then look to do is to see how, how we can translate that kind of unique insight to some kind of commercial impact. So typically that involves getting some form of kind of translational funding in to further invest in that piece of IP and to de-risk it. And then looking at two things, which is either to license it to a company, um, and we do about 150 licenses a year. So there's quite a lot of licenses going on from Cambridge Technology, 
or we look to see about how we can use that piece of technology to create a new spinner company. And so uh, when we do that, we then have another part of Cambridge Enterprise, which is a seed fund. So we have a, our own venture fund within Cambridge Enterprise that has somewhere in the region of about 40 to 50 million pounds to invest over the next five to six years. And really the goal of that fund is to be the first check that goes into companies. So we want to invest really early at kind of pathfinder level, at pre-seed level, at seed level, and then even at series A, we'll provide some level of funding. So, you know, the goal there is that we will invest early and we will help those founders to develop a credible business case and to ideally syndicate that round of investment with the right partners so that there is a pathway to that company scaling to the point that it can really grow and become self-sustaining. So we have that kind of piece to what we do. So, you know, in principle, what we should be able to do is to support anybody within the university from that kind of early gestation of, I have an idea, all the way through to the protection of the idea, the de-risking of the idea, the licensing or the investment of that idea to the creating of a company all the way through ideally to an exit. So it's a really incredible, to my mind, after looking at other places, integrated offering that's in Cambridge already to support people who are looking to, I suppose, be entrepreneurial and to take ideas forward. So that, that's what Cambridge Enterprise does in, in a Brilliant. Um, before we dig a little bit deeper yeah. into the class itself, um, you're a man of science, even though you, you don't you don't hide to yourself that way. But uh, you studied physics, you studied material science. Uh, you were for a long time at Trinity College, not that Trinity College, Trinity College Dublin. Um, and you have some experience in the US as well, particularly from Princeton University, if I'm not if I'm not wrong. Um, when you came to Cambridge, everyone says this is a very unique environment, very unique cluster you actually have the comparison. So when you arrive, what do you think really makes this place special? And was there something you were maybe negatively surprised by? You were like, oh, wow, like this could work a bit better. This is something we have to improve. Yeah, well, I mean, what makes it special is somewhat self-evident. Perhaps everybody living here every day and going to the college every day or the university takes it somewhat for granted, but, you know, it's a top three, top five global university. The quality of the faculty is incredible in terms of the kind of research excellence and capability that's there. The amount of investment in research within the university is incredible. As an example, there is more money spent every year in Cambridge than the entire Irish higher education system. So one institution, which is not a large institution in global terms, you know, certainly in terms of student numbers, um, it's got its huge disproportionate kind of uh, research capability. Um, the infrastructure here is incredible. You know, um, when you visit some of the research labs and you see the quality of the infrastructure that's there, it's amazing. Um, and obviously there's this incredible um, piece of fortune or piece of foresight, depending how people tell the story. But, you know, going back over 40, 50 years, you know, the first, uh, Science and Technology Park in the UK was in Cambridge about 50 years ago, uh, and it's still there and it's thriving, you know, uh, which uh, Trinity College set up. Um, and that really stimulated this uh, development of the Cambridge cluster where you have um, really a big diversity of companies across uh, sectors. So you've got the kind of AI, um, deep tech kind of quantum technology piece all the way through to very fundamental life science capability all within a kind of five mile radius and I think when you look at the numbers of Cambridge there is uh, 5,000 knowledge intensive companies and over 100,000 people working those companies within a seven mile radius of where we're sitting here now you know and that density of innovation capability makes Cambridge really the leading innovation cluster in Europe um, and really second really to only what you see uh, adjacent to MIT and Stanford. So there's an incredible kind of depth of capability here within Cambridge that, that's, that's very special. Um, having said that, it does miss things that you see in other places. I mean, the first thing it misses to some extent is the scale. It, it's a town of 150,000 people and um, 
you know, finding the talent to drive company growth in Cambridge is hard, you know, because Cambridge is an amazing university producing amazing graduates, but it's not producing that many graduates every year. I think the student numbers are somewhere around 12,000 or something. So, you know, uh, I think UCL has got like 50,000 students, for example. So, you know, it's a very um, kind of clear offering that it has with institutions. So that kind of scale is missing a little bit. And to be honest, I think one of the challenges Cambridge is going to have is that um, when you compare what's happening here in Cambridge with other innovation ecosystems, we miss a kind of central note to that in some ways. So in Cambridge, what you have at the center is the colleges and the university. And that old Cambridge piece is very, very special and uh, really can't be duplicated anywhere, really. Um, but what you don't have is an enterprise heart at the center of what you see in other jurisdictions. And so I think that makes it harder for people when they come to Cambridge to connect that ecosystem as easy as they might like to. So we've got that density and critical mass of companies uh, in the surrounding area, but finding a location in the center that acts as a kind of node or hope to that, I think would really amplify what's happening here. And that's why it's great to see the colleges and places like King's and other colleges putting energy into creating that kind of entrepreneurial conversation within the center of the town, because I think that is going to become really important in the future. So, um, so I think that they're the positives and, and the kind of challenges that I think that are here for Cambridge. No, it's brilliant. And I think that it really leads me to my next question, because I feel maybe the reason why people are a little bit confused about what's going on is because things are very decentralized. Um, to everyone who maybe feels this way as I did, um, I really recommend going to the Cambridge Enterprise website, which I wish I'd done, or done sooner. Um, it is really nicely done when you click on that um, ecosystem, ecosystem tab. You really see the overview of departments, communities, networks, programs and societies. But there is a lot. There's a lot of them. And I'm really curious to know how would you, what would you recommend to a student how to navigate this? And from your point of view, I'd be sort of interested in your day-to-day -day life business, how you meet those people, how you coordinate all of those things. How do you even stay up to date when there are tens of events happening every single day? And it's very difficult to, you know, spot that a new initiative is being launched. Yeah, look, it's, that's a great question. In some ways, it's, like, it's a real kind of first world problem. You know, there's so many things happening. You've got to decide where you put your energy. Um, I mean, I've got a particular perspective on that because I didn't know, I'd never been to Cambridge actually when I took this job because I took it during the whole uh, COVID kind of lockdown period. And so all my interviews were uh, online and virtual. And so uh, I literally came to Cambridge for the first time in 25 years, uh, the week before I started uh, the job, you know. So I did come in with a really cold start to the ecosystem. Um, uh, but I have found Cambridge, despite the complexity, because of its size, it's relatively small, not too challenging to, um, uh, to navigate, you know. Um, so uh, the first thing really is um, uh, in Cambridge, I've found uh, a huge openness within those who are either experienced entrepreneurs or venture capitalists or angels to meet and talk, you know. So if you're really passionate about finding out what's happening here, I think you have to be proactive and reach out to people. Um, and often what you find is that one conversation connects you with another, which connects you with another. And, and suddenly you've got a kind of whole array of pieces. And I found a real generosity and a kind of collegiate approach to that, which I think is very helpful. I mean, there are a couple of very obvious nodes within um, the university. I mean, Cambridge Enterprise is one, um, and we're very open to helping guide people to the right place. The judge, as we've seen from tonight, is another and clearly has a huge kind of connectivity with the ecosystem. There's lots of um, both student and postdoc entrepreneurship societies that are really well connected to the environment. So, you know, if you just took those kind of four or five touch points, uh, a couple of conversations there would quickly connect you. And then you've got places like the Bradfield Center, which I think has got huge energy and, and kind of a huge place and role to play in terms of bringing that ecosystem together. I just wish it, wish it was in the middle of town to some extent, you know, in terms of that piece. So I think 
between the uh, entrepreneurship student societies, the postdoc societies, Cambridge Enterprise, the judge and Bradfield. I think that will get you wherever you need to, you know. So, um, I, I mean, my advice for these is always just to break it down into kind of tractable steps, you know. If you took it as a month, that's kind of one cup of coffee a week with each of those people, you'd suddenly have a very clear roadmap about where to go and who to talk to. Um, and then I think you'd find that you'd get a little bit narrower as you decide you need to talk to people around tech or life sciences or consumer goods or whatever it might be. You'll, you'll find the, um, the kind of more specialist capability that does exist in the ecosystem then to kind of provide that advice and, and understanding. Brilliant. Um, I feel like loads of people are starting to get into entrepreneurship, which to me personally, I absolutely love it. I love to see it. Um, I'd be really interesting to know how us as students or departments or colleges, what can we do in our to make stuff more centralized? Um, so when people launch new things, new initiatives, do they reach out to you or does it usually happen in a way that you sort of find out, then you you know reach out. You're like, okay, we're going to include you on our website because I sometimes feel like it's a little bit unfair on those umbrella organisations such as um, such as Cambridge Enterprise to try to tackle everything. So I would like to know from you what us as students, full of ideas and inventions, can do to make our job easier. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I don't think it has to be complicated. Um, so we have a a really good communications team within Cambridge Enterprise. So just letting people know what you're doing is a relatively easy first step. I mean, often, uh, I guess people, when they're trying to get new initiatives up and running, uh, either oversell, which can kind of get the huge energy and passion for it, but maybe sometimes miss how it connects with people and their particular purposes, or they're too nervous to push it out, you know? So I just think you need a really clear kind of well, what we would call, I suppose, a problem statement. What it is you're trying to do, and what's the problem you're trying to solve, and how does that connect to people? And if you just let the different stakeholders know, I think people are really happy to support that. Also, you know, you don't need to do it all yourself because there's a lot of um, ready-made networks that we manage, you know, or Cambridge Network manages, or you know, the judge will have. And so, getting your event not trying to drive your own communications, but getting it, your activity onto other people's communication changes where you leverage all of their networks and all of their contacts can be a much more efficient way to do it. I mean, once that's structured, right, you get all the messaging back, but you don't have to do all the work to, to push it out. So um, I think that's uh, probably the, the simplest ways to do it. You know, I mean, just on, on the first point, I mean, you're saying there is a huge inter interest in entrepreneurship now, and I think that's, Fantastic, you know, and I think that's driven, I think now from the fact that students are much more um, mission driven than they were 15, 20 years ago. Most students want to do something that has meaning and purpose for them, as opposed to just bring in a, a paycheck, you know, um, and I think it's fantastic that people are thinking that way early on, because the right time to do that is actually in the first kind of 10 years out of college, when you're really thinking about how to shape your career or what to do. Um, so I think that's really important, but, um, but I think it's also important to not get so hung up on it being your idea or your initiative. I mean, the most important thing is if you're gonna spend to five, 10 years of your life driving something. You want it to be something that is successful, has scale, has impact, something that you can do. And it's great if it's your own idea, but there's so many good ideas out there that are looking for enthusiastic, motivated entrepreneurs to come in and support and grow businesses. So I wouldn't be, you also have to know when to stop pushing your idea, when to join up with others and, and, and really drive that. Otherwise, it can be a it can be a frustrating journey as opposed to an empowering journey. So um, I think it's important if that's the path you want to go, that you put your energy into the thing that gives you the best chance of making your career and your life a success as opposed to being too committed to being your idea. There's lots of people looking for co-founders who are willing to go on that journey with them if you can if you can do that right. I think that's a brilliant answer and this is our like elab pledge to try and like find more synergies because sometimes i really yeah. do feel like we're all trying to reinvent the wheel and for what purpose so that was really insightful now i would like to dig a bit deep into the cambridge enterprise from my research i feel like the best target group for that really is like a research driven 
innovation. Loads of that I feel is coming from the PhD. Um, if I am that student, where do I start? I have an idea, maybe I have a keen course mate or a friend from college. Um, what do I do? How do I start? Yeah, so, I mean, in general, if, you've, if you are working within a research group and you've got a great idea, I mean, typically that needs to work in tandem with the PI that's involved, so the professor within the university that's involved, you know, um, and that shouldn't be seen, and I, I, I would certainly encourage people not to see that as a kind of limitation. In fact, it's the opposite, because if you can get your professor energized around the idea, typically they do not want to leave the university. They, they're interested in the career they chose to be, which is typically in Cambridge, to be a kind of world leading researcher. Um, but what they are interested in is to find either PhD students or postdocs who are prepared to take those ideas and run with them as they leave the university. So you've got already a kind of ready-made synergy there where you've got um, an experienced kind of technical founder in, in the faculty member who, when you're looking to raise funding and raise capital, can provide that kind of sense of um, uh, kind of confidence to the investor community. While at the same time, you're bringing a whole different set of skills that they don't want to bring, which is a kind of commitment to driving an entrepreneurial business and to spending your time and energy and career making that happen. So uh, to me, that's kind of the pathway. But really, the first thing is to pick up the phone and to speak to uh, our tech transfer offices within the university. And so what they do is they sit down and talk to you about what is the idea you have and um, and really that starts with, is there a novel idea there? Is that an idea that can be patented or can be protected in some way from an intellectual property perspective? And if so, how would you go about defining that? Do you have freedom to operate? Do, is, it a, is there kind of clear water around that idea? And once that is determined, uh, then a strategy for how one would commercialize that idea then takes place. So you do need to make sure first you've got that um, let's call it that defensibility about the idea because it, it can be very frustrating for a, a PhD student or a postdoc to spend an awful lot of time developing a business proposition around an idea that they simply don't have the freedom to, to, to kind of manage or, or, or deliver. But once you've done that, then we do really look at um, two things. What's the pathway to market for that idea and what additional investment might be needed to bring that idea to the point that it's ready to go to market. And typically there is new investment needed. And um, in a university environment, we normally protect intellectual property at a stage that is a little earlier than you would see in a commercial environment. And that's driven from the fact that uh, faculty want to publish. And so they need to protect the ideas before they publish. And they also need to use things like patents and intellectual property to support them winning new research grants or new research funding. And so once you've protected that idea, um, there's often a kind of further investment stage to get it to the point where it's really investable from the private market, from a venture perspective or a commercial perspective. And so we work with the teams then to look at how we can raise capital to do that. And there's a lot of public funding for that. And that is definitely the best source of capital at that stage because it's a non-dilutive capital that doesn't take equity. It comes into the company and you can spend it and manage it as you want or not into the company, typically into the university but to support the company objective at, at that stage um, and that normally brings you to the point where you need to get some kind of pre-seed investment and that's the first investment that will go into the company that will be really structured about uh, building the initial management team uh, maybe looking to build the first business case that would uh, be able to drive investment into the company uh, maybe getting some uh, first pre-commercial work done, so prototyping, uh, alpha customer, beta customer, in relation to what the technology or product would be. And we would have a team that would work with you all through that process, all the way to getting to the point that you would have a, um, uh, well, we say business plan, but in truth, nobody writes a business plan anymore. It's a, it's a pitch deck, it's a proposition to the market that, uh, that we would be uh, able to say that we would commit typically the first check to the business. So. How that normally works would be uh, our seed fund team, our venture team would uh, look at the business and would bring it to our investment committee. And the investment committee would normally say, we'll write a check for a quarter of a million. 
and we have a sidecar fund which is managed by Parkwalk that would match that check so you'd have a half a million check but that would typically sub be subject to you raising a million and a half or two million at a certain valuation so we don't often give a check in isolation we want to see the check syndicated we want to see people prepared to share the risk and we want to be able to see people coming in who are investors coming in who've got the capacity to support the company through a series A and a series B round. Because if you syndicate with the wrong partners, you can run out a road in a business really early without having the capital to see it through. But we will help identify those other investors and help drive it. So there is a clear pathway there for a PhD student with an idea. It's not a short pathway, so it's a journey over a number of years, but it's a pathway that will help protect IP all the way through to the syndicated investment and. Uh, uh, a really a company that has a couple of years of serious capital to drive uh, drive business growth. Um, and having worked in other places in the US and, and in Europe, you know, that um, uh, kind of integrated pipeline of resources is very, very unique. Um, I can't think of another university in the UK that has a, a seed fund like we operate within its university. Um, most of them operate some kind of partner venture fund where they don't have control themselves over the investment decisions. And in the case of Cambridge, Cambridge University is investing in the seed fund and we are investing on a double bottom line agenda. How do we support the impact of the research of the university and how do we make money? But it, it's both. So, you know, we're really prepared to work uh, with companies to help build a commercial proposition, even if the initial proposition you know, isn't meeting that bar. So, you know, to have that support built into the institution is really unique and valuable. Amazing. You touched upon the ownership and the intellectual property rights. Um, I am very far from being a researcher and doing anything meaningful in academia. However, having spoken to some of the PhD students, when they're sort of deciding if they should firstly, like, you know, finish their PhD and then maybe start doing something they if they should really like squeeze that in and like use all the resources and storage while they're studying. Uh, the question they always raise is, um, should I use the network available? Should I use the Cambridge cluster? Should I use the Cambridge enterprise? How will my idea, my ownership, my IP going to be protected? Like how binding it is for me to, to you know, to, to, yeah. to use it there. So it's important to separate two things. If there is a student who's developed intellectual property in isolation while they're in the university, they own that IP and it's theirs to control. Now they can choose to work with the university as a organization that's going to uh, file that IP and protect that IP and take the costs of managing the IP. But in return for that, as the business is created, then the university licenses that IP back to the business and there's a, there's a percentage return that comes to the university. But, but the, the, the student doesn't have to do that. They can own and control their IP by themselves. And in fact, we're very happy to both support and advise students who want to take that route. So um, that is available to them. If you're a student who's come up with a piece of IP as part of your PhD or uh, during the research, that's a different piece because typically the funding for that research has come from public bodies and they expect in that situation for the university to protect and manage and own the IP. But it's really important that people don't see that as a barrier because the university does that really on the behalf of the inventors. So if the university um, has an equity stake in that company or takes a license in that company, it's distributed back to the founders as well as the department in which the university or on which the, uh, uh, the research was taking place in. So the founders still get the majority of the returns that come from that invention and it just channels itself back through the university. So in either situation, you know, um, if you've got a great idea, the best thing to do is to quickly protect the idea because that gives you the and let's call it the line in the sand that clarifies that idea as being both original, yours, and protectable. And, and then, yes, you absolutely need to use the resources that are available within the university and outside to think about how to drive that. And I mean, I would say the best thing you can do is to get that kind of um, uh, 
uh, non-executive advisor capability that you trust, somebody you trust who understands the market you're going for, who understands the technology and can genuinely put your best interest in the interest of the company first and, and advise you. And uh, if you don't know how to find that person, that's something uh, I'm sure the judge or um, a Cambridge Enterprise or other places can do for you because you know we've got a pretty deep network across lots of different industries within the cluster. And I think in general, it's, it's very straightforward to get somebody who is prepared to give back and be passionate about your idea for your benefit. Um, and I would really encourage that early. It doesn't have to be, and, and entrepreneurship isn't a kind of solo experience. It's a deeply collaborative experience. And if you're trying to do this and control this in isolation, you're really losing the kind of wisdom of crowds, you know, and you've got to leverage that. So, um, so you can go either pathway, but, uh, Cambridge is unique compared to any other university in the UK. It doesn't take an automatic right on any piece of IP. So uh, other universities do that. The IP policy here in the university is structured completely to favor the inventor and favor the kind of uh, the innovator within the, uh, within the university. So you've really nothing to fear from the university here. It's genuinely got the best interests of the inventors at heart in, in what it does. And so I, I, I think I would encourage that situation as best you can to work with the university. Um, I think you'll find speed is in essence and it'll accelerate your capacity to deliver will be my instinct. I think that's really reassuring. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm sure that some people needed to hear that to not be, to not be scared and come forward with that idea. Um, since we have quite a large JVS crowd here, I am interested if you could elaborate, it's a shame that Bruno isn't here, so I'm kind of asking <laughs> you to take up on that role. If you could tell us a little bit more about the collaboration with the Judge Business School and particularly how maybe us as business school students who are developing an idea can use the resources from the Cambridge Enterprise from the other side. And by that, I mean that, for example, um, I've spoken to some brilliant uh, PhD students who are like working in, in data or with AI, etc. And I would really be keen on maybe funding their research or helping them from the other side because it could potentially benefit my business. I can bring them on board, etc. And I think that um, quite a lot of um, EMBA students or MBA students might be, um, you know, in, in a similar situation trying to, you know, get that brilliant PhD student. Is there a way how we can do that? Yeah, so uh, there is good collaboration between Cambridge Enterprise and the judge, but I would say it's uh, operating at a nice kind of informal level of engagement. So um, many of our staff support programs being run within the judge, be it the Accelerate program or the social entrepreneurship program, other pieces. So we would go and uh, give uh, talks or lectures or engagement on that. We support and judge some of the kind of competitions and the pieces that are there. Um, and as we were chatting earlier outside, you know, as Cambridge Enterprise is looking for um, help in determining kind of market fit of technologies that exist within its portfolio, um, MBA students do get involved in helping to kind of identify, you know, where the fit might be, what the technology market fit might be, how to take it forward. So those kind of informal pieces uh, work very well. Uh, I would like to see a more formal connection and we've begun those conversations actually over the last few months so I think there's definitely opportunity to strengthen that. In terms of the piece of um, MBA students thinking about wanting to be connected to an entrepreneurship business, I mean I would really make that kind of desire known both at the judge and at, at the likes of Cambridge Enterprise. We are always looking for one of the biggest challenges is finding executive talent that will come in to support company formation. And um, typically what we have within the Cambridge environment is a really um, deep kind of technical capability within, within the environment. So a kind of chief scientific officer, chief technical officer level, all those kind of pieces. We've got those skills in depth, finding people who've got experience in um, investment, in, in venture, in company growth, in operations, uh, in scaling and in internationalization, they're all skills that are needed. Um, they do exist within the cluster, you know, because there's such a rich diversity of companies here. But obviously what the MBA program brings in is kind of talent from much broader than the cluster, you know, from the UK and internationally in general. And so, 
you know, being able to tap into that is, is a huge advantage if we can do it. So I think that's, um, uh, that's something we'd love to see happen a little bit more and we certainly encourage it. Um, you know, it's just a different mix, you know, because uh, MBA students are coming with such a diverse array of backgrounds. So finding the right fit with the right company needs to be done, but I think there's a real opportunity there. So, but I, again, I don't think it needs to be complicated. Making it known to people that you have an interest uh, that immediately allows our venture team to begin to think about the companies on its portfolio and what they can do. And um, one thing we're also have been running the last few years is a postdoc business plan competition. And that brings a lot of the early ideas that do exist within the research labs into a kind of focus program that runs over a kind of four to six month window. And if you had a desire to get involved in a early high tech company that is at the kind of uh, company formation stage where you'd be a co-founder that is a great competition to try and find ways to connect with the portfolio of technologies that's existing in the university so that's a really easy win and that will be advertised in april we will be shortlisting kind of finalists in june and all those finalists will be looking for business partners to come in and support the company development so um, you know, those companies over the last few years have gone to raise tens of millions of capital. I mean, they're really high quality uh, offerings at the end. So um, for, for people who are looking for the right entrepreneurial fit, that's a great way to, to get involved and, and shape it. No, absolutely. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, that what you said really leads me to my sort of last bit of questions before opening uh, the floor for, for our audience. Um, and you have a vast experience with several university founded startups. Um, and I think I'm not wrong to say that you meet in Cambridge, you meet um, various different people um, every single week. Everyone wants to network, everyone wants to collaborate. It is very difficult to choose where you put your energy. So I am interested in your opinion, if you could share with us some lessons learned to give us a head start. Uh, firstly, I'd like to hear about some success stories. It could be an, a good venture, it could be a great team fit, it could be a great dynamic or very well managed expectations from a partnership. And then um, I do like a bit of misery. So I would like to hear um, about a failure story. Um, what didn't work? What's like a common fit for maybe some unmanaged expectations, unmet expectations from what you've witnessed either here in Cambridge or during your career? Yeah, so, um, well, the success story one, um, in Trinity, we set up a, a student entrepreneurship accelerator that we ran over the summer, and it was funded by Trinity Angels um, in, in Dublin. Um, and we set the first one up, uh, the, we set it up really with a view that it would be a nice experience for students, which in hindsight was just so patronizing because, um, you know, the students didn't view it as experience, they viewed it as something that they wanted to do to drive new company growth. And the very first year, a company came out of it, which was a social entrepreneurship company, which are very difficult to get going called Food Cloud. Um, and it's really worth looking up. It's the most amazing company 10 years on. Um, they started out with this really, really simple proposition, which is that every day there is food waste from restaurants and supermarkets that are going um, that are literally been uh, dumped while at the same time in the same uh, locations uh, geographically, there's charities with huge food need um, and underprivileged areas not being served. And they just created a really clever app that connected charities, food depots, uh, supermarkets uh, that were throwing food out with local charities in the area. And they got traction immediately. Um, the big supermarket chains brought in, Tesco uh, uh, being the biggest one. Um, then they got it upscaled to the big food depots and uh, a decade later they have a business of a couple of hundred people and every month they're, con con they're doing about two, two million meals of food waste to food need through this kind of digital platform. They've internationalized and have operations in the UK and the US and all mission driven, all social entrepreneurship, um, hugely empowering story of two students that had a very clear proposition and we're able to understand how to operationalize that in a way uh, I mean that's a me too product in a way there was nothing intellectual property orientated about that there was nothing 
unique about it. They just actually found a way to inspire people to participate and do it. And um, so to me, that's been the most uh, eye-opening story. I mean, I've, I've seen lots of companies raise lots of venture and have exits, you know, but uh, nothing that's actually had that kind of global impact from a really clear problem. Day one, they knew what they wanted to do and they, ever, they delivered it. You know, the, the big... Uh, the big failures um, are often around, um, uh, I mean, my own career um, uh, back in 2001, uh, nanotechnology was uh, the next big thing. It was around the dot-com bubble. I worked for a company called Antira that raised 20 million pounds as a, uh, from a UK fund evolution capital to invest in uh, integrating intellectual property assets together to create a kind of nan nanotechnology portal. And it honestly, I look back and wonder why anybody gave us any money at all. You know, it was clearly <laughs> doomed to fail from the beginning and it did fail, you know, because we didn't have a market fix. We didn't have a sense of uh, how we were going to commercialize the technology. We just had this view that there were. Uh, IP assets out there that if were integrated and conglomerated could add value. And we did create businesses from it, but we just didn't have the clarity of purposes. And after two years, that just ran out of steam, you know, because you needed much more patient capital and deep pockets to drive that kind of business. And the big lesson from that really is you've got to get your market fit early. If you're going to be driving a business growth, if you're going to be uh, looking to raise capital, you know, early pathways to revenue are critical. It gives everybody confidence that you know what you're doing, that you've got customers, that your product has somebody that's prepared to pay money for it. And although that is such a self-evident lesson that you learn probably day one in business school and everything else, it's so clearly the one thing that people get wrong all the time, you know, in terms of getting that right there and getting something out quick and not being prepared, be prepared to kind of learn while you're commercializing, I think is a really key piece. So, you know, that's something that went badly wrong. I was involved with that. I've certainly learned a lesson from long term. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It means a lot. Um, so that was sort of my last question. Now I would like to open the floor audience and also those of you online, please pop your questions. We have this purple catch box, so we're going to throw that at you. Adam's going to throw it, not me, um, and because I would injure you. And um, and yeah, just to say a question. Yeah, so we have one question uh, from the online audience. Eugene asks, if you have those executive skills that you were talking about, how do you make yourself available to, you mentioned the postdoc competition, but maybe if there are other ways how to go, potential executive candidates can make themselves available? Yeah, so um, the best thing is to, uh, we have somebody who runs in our communications office the postdoc competition, so just make yourself available there. So I can, uh, I can share an email for that afterwards if people want. I don't know how the best way to circulate that to this group is, but you know, we, we can absolutely get an email for people to write to, no problem. Or people can just write to me, it's not an issue either, no problem. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. O'Brien. Uh, my question is, uh, when it comes to students uh, who establish business ventures and startups, uh, which departments or colleges are represented the most? Is it Judge Business School or would we be surprised? Thank you. Yeah, so I don't have the answer for that in terms of uh, the integrated volume. So from a research perspective, uh, it's not the Judge Business School. So it would be Computer Lab, it would be the Medical School, uh, it would be Engineering. They will be the big kind of drivers of new companies. But there is a big cohort of companies that are founded by graduates um, that have come out of the university in terms of the training, the skill, maybe even the ideation was in the university. but um, they haven't needed to use the, or haven't chosen to use the kind of uh, framework of the university to drive the business. Um, and I suspect there's plenty from the judge business school that fall into that category. I guess people from the judge may be better positioned to answer that than me, but from Cambridge Enterprise perspective, we don't see that cohort of companies so much. We tend to see the research driven businesses a little bit more. Um, 
But actually, we are producing for Cambridge that data, and in the next two weeks, we will have it. And I think I'm sure it'll be published on our website and publicly because one of the big challenges with Cambridge is that uh, there are many what people call sneak out companies that have come from within the university environment but have gone out on their own. And, and we've been trying to track those and identify which Cambridge uh, graduates in recent in the last three years have raised venture back companies. And so we'll be able to track that back now and map it on to the department school faculty they were in and give you a much better answer to that question. But I suspect that it's interesting. I had um, lunch today with a Cambridge graduate from a while back who um, um, was in uh, history and has spent the last 25 years doing investment management in UBS and has found it and been involved in loads of companies. So, you know, uh, there's no question entrepreneurial focus and capability comes from right across the spectrum. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the time you've taken for this talk. Um, what uh, two questions. First, what percentage does the school take for research-led um, projects, or does it vary based off of some factors? Yeah, it does vary a little bit, but the broad rule is a third, a third, a third. So typically the um, university gets a third, the department a third, and the founders, or it's not the founders, the, uh, the inventors a third, but it does vary with different thresholds of um, royalty. So uh, at the lower royalty levels, the founders get more. And as the success increments up, it gets a little bit distributed more evenly. So the IP policy is public and on the website and it has all of those numbers in it. And uh, the real great piece about um, Cambridge is that say, taking Oxford as an example, if you spin out of Oxford, the university takes automatically a 20% equity stake. And uh, in Cambridge, the university doesn't take any equity stake from the beginning. So you've really got a pro entrepreneurial kind of system here within the university that values the independence of the inventors to drive their own business opportunity. And where we take equity and is only when we invest, so we get that equity like every other investor by putting money in, or if we license IP into the company, we might get a piece of equity and a royalty. But, um, but the general principle is that the uh, inventor gets the freedom to choose what they do. You know, it's an incredibly favorable environment compared to anywhere else really globally. So um, uh, I know people are um, conscious of that return piece and how that works. You know. My own view is that uh, working with the institution, you tend to get uh, maybe a slightly smaller piece of a much larger pie. And I think people need to think about it in an integrated sense and, and, and look at it. But I, I think the deals are, are, are very good from what I've seen elsewhere globally, yeah. Sounds good, thank you. And then maybe a related question. Um, you mentioned MIT and Stanford, and I know a lot of this talk has been around ways that Cambridge is or and can continue to be competitive and, and building this amazing tech cluster. Um, but looking at those as examples of, you know, kind of high on the ivory um, um, mountaintop, uh, what are some of the maybe two or three areas that you think, if you could wave a magic wand, that you would replicate about what they're doing that could increase the amount of capital and, and innovation in, in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, I spent a lot of time in both of those places in my last role trying to look at creating an innovation district proposition in, in, in Dublin. Um, I think it's a little harsh to compare Cambridge to both those places, um, not because that shouldn't be the aspiration, but the geography of those places is so different, you know. So Boston is a it's a big city, you know, and it's not just got MIT, it's got MIT, it's got Harvard, it's got Boston College. So you've got a kind of scale of activity there that you don't find in what is essentially a small market town in the UK, you know, um, and Stanford's similar, you know, in terms of what's there in the Valley. But the big difference really between what's happening in Cambridge and those environments is if I was doing my role in uh, MIT or uh, Stanford, you wouldn't have all of the programs that exist 
in Cambridge because the market, broadly speaking, looks after everybody. You know, you've got pre-seed, seed, angel, scale-up capital all ready to deploy, ready to go within the market. So the universities there don't play a hands-on role in venture creation. They actually are licensing offices, you know, so they license technology out and the market funds it and does all the rest. So that's one of the big kind of differences. Um, so we definitely have a venture deficiency here. So uh, we need the university to play a role in closing that gap. Otherwise, you simply wouldn't see the early stage seed capital that, that's needed in this environment. And ironically, we're also struggling at the other end of that pipeline. So um, a number of companies I know now have got significant venture funding in Cambridge, but a lot of the capital is coming from the US. Um, and what you tend to see there is that there are conditions on that capital that the CEO needs to be based in Boston or they need to have a research headquarters in the US. And, and so you begin to see some of the intellectual creativity of the company and indeed some of the economic and the activity of the company move outside the jurisdiction. And you see that big debate at the moment with ARM, which is a huge Cambridge success story as to where it should IPO. Should it IPO in, in, in NASDAQ or, or in London? And generally, the view is that it'll, it'll do it in NASDAQ because there's just a capital set in the US that's more tuned to the technology market. What you see here in the kind of in the UK stock exchange is uh, it's petrochemical companies and it's, uh, um, you know, kind of old style businesses that are driving it, not tech companies in the same way you see uh, in the US. So there is a cultural difference between what's happening here in the US, which requires the university and the ecosystem to play more of a role in helping to kind of shape you know the ecosystem the other piece that i would really encourage around cambridge is this idea of a uh, we need to showcase this innovation and vision and story within the town somehow you know um, when politicians when venture capitalists when investors come to visit cambridge it's very hard for them to understand the depth and scale of the innovation ecosystem here because it's so invisible compared to what you see if you go to Kendall Square in Boston or if you, if you go to Stanford and some of the parks, you know, and so uh, somehow we've got to find a way to bring that sense of innovation capability that does exist here to life that uh, resonates with the kind of external community. And I think that's important to attracting, retaining talent and investment. Um, being cognizant of the time, um, could you just share with us some of the tips and tricks for for like budding entrepreneurs to find like co-founders or maybe founding members of the team in, within the Cambridge ecosystem? Because we have all talked about the limitations, but then we have to work with what we have right now. And most of us are here for one year MBA program. I'm seeing a lot of my cohort people. Um, given that, I just don't want to look further into the future how we can evolve from where we are. I just want to know what's available for me right now and what I can use in the next coming months so that I can you know, hit the ground running, basically. Yeah, so it really does depend on, uh, on the business, you know, but um, uh, you may find that there are like-minded people within the university, and I guess that is best found through some of the university societies or some of the um, uh, kind of networking events that will be operated by the likes of, of, of the Joe Journey Cambridge Enterprise. But I would probably encourage somebody who's really serious or has an idea to look beyond the university to the cluster because you're going to maybe find a, a richer set of kind of experience and expertise within that. So Cambridge Angels would be a great place to start because um, so Simon Thorpe runs that, but it's a really well run network. Um, uh, and just to get to talking to a couple of those angels who are not afraid to come in early and help shape and craft businesses, I think will be really powerful. Um, uh, to begin to think about finding, you know, so depending where your niche is within with the business, but look up the, the four or five companies in the Cambridge ecosystem that are in the space that you want to operate your business in. I would just reach out to the leadership team in those companies and ask to meet for a coffee and explain what you want to do and, and say you're looking for advice. And um, the great thing is never go ask for money, you know, always go ask for advice. You know, if, if you're getting advice and you're getting guidance, people get emotionally connected to wanting to help you. Money follows, you know, 
if you go looking for money, people are just inclined to shut conversations down too early. So I'd go and talk to them and get that advice. And you'll find pretty much every sector, there are companies here of some level of scale and capability, you know, or, you know, another way to look at it would be to go and look at the four or five big venture firms in the area, be it um, Cambridge Innovation Capital or Amadeus or Capital or uh, Meltwind or uh, the Angels or Parkwalk. Look at the companies they've invested in over the last five years and do a track against which sectors are aligned with where you're going. And then go find out who's managing that investment in those firms, you know. And you'll pretty quickly find there's four or five people who are actually managing most of the investments in the kind of sector you want to look in. And they will really help you connect to that network and they'll all give you time. I mean, deal flow is what they do for, for a business. So, you know, the idea that they're going to get first eyes on what your idea is and help you, it's just in their interest to do it. So they'll do it and I do it very easily. So they'd be just very practical things you can do. It's like a weekend Googling will give you all the names you need to talk to. Then you're just going to have to find out which ones are going to give you the best return. But genuinely, I think you could find very quickly a couple of people who are prepared to invest time to support you. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. I'm conscious of your time. Um, so I'm going to selfishly save the last question for myself. <laughs> and I would like to ask you, um, what are you currently working on that keeps you energized, keeps you excited? It could be both a personal or a working thing, but what are you looking forward to now the most? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the last six months I've been immersed in developing a new five-year strategy for Cambridge Enterprise. And, um, we're just at the point now of uh, even for what we do, we have to raise the strategy. We have to convince people to invest in it and, and uh, we then have to deliver it. So uh, we're just at that point now where we've thankfully persuaded the different stakeholders we have to invest in it. And we're now really beginning to ramp up. And one of the key things we're trying to do there, um, uh, two big things I'll tell you that we're trying to do. One is we are looking to establish what we're calling a translational investment fund. So a fund that we will manage to invest in really early stage technology to bring it to the point that we feel it's ready for private investment. Um, and I think this is going to be just a game changer for Cambridge University in terms of uh, deepening the pipeline of technology. And the other thing we're doing is we're looking to set up uh, an accelerator for Cambridge Enterprise to support the university. Um, and that's one of the things we've been talking to the judge about for how we can connect and collaborate with that. But to my mind, um, the, the challenge with Cambridge Enterprise at the moment, and somewhat it comes back to some of these questions that have been asked, is that founding a company can be a little bit of an isolating experience. And I'm a real believer in having a kind of cohort going through an experience at the same time. And I think if we can create an accelerator to support you know, 15, 20 uh, technology companies in each year going through a similar experience of growth and development, I think it will really enhance both the learnings and the experience and the success of what those companies can achieve. And um, so we're really trying to get an accelerator to pilot later this summer. And that's a huge exciting thing for me. So those are two things that are taking a lot of energy. That's and amazing. I would like to wrap up with a quote from Arthur who joined us online. Great event, very informative and constructive. Such a great speaker. I couldn't agree more. So can we please have a round of applause for Jeremy? Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. I hope you had a good time. You know where to go. Please do not be like me and do not find the Cambridge Enterprise website this late. So go do your research. Um, join us ideally tomorrow for the Zoom with Alan Merrill and Stephen Fine. Do join us on Friday for uh, the belated celebration of International Women's Day. I'm hoping to see more female than I see today. But thank you, ladies, for being here. Um, and then we will be hosting an entrepreneurship ball on 22nd of March together with KeyTech. On 24th of March, we are having our first event in Chapel, to which you're most, most warmly invited to. Um, we will be joined by Brigadier Zach Stenning, who is the head of strategy uh, for the British military within the um, uh, Ministry of Defence. And in May, we have the CEO of Rolls-Royce Born East coming to join us. So um, do join our newsletter so you have a priority invite and we'd be very excited to see you soon. Please enjoy the wine next door, keep the conversation going and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you.